so go ahead and open up your Bible to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And as you're turning there, just by way of reminder, we're, we're going over God is balanced. God is balanced. This is part two. And we're going to focus today on how God is love. Now, I just want to be sure you don't think we went modern today, okay, by this subject. This is what every church in the AV is preaching every week. That God is love, God is love, God is love. But let's remember what the real title is. God is balanced. Okay? Sometimes love doesn't look uh, uh, fuzzy and snuggly. You know, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. If somebody broke into your house where your kids and grandchildren were, that love that you have for your family would pick up a revolver and put down whoever broke into your house. That's love. Amen. Amen. And, and if you weren't willing to do that, maybe you didn't have a revolver, you would pick up a bat. My point is that love that you have for those individuals under your protection would, would turn very violent very quick should somebody try to come after them. Amen. 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 <laughs> now, there's a lot of confusion today that has stemmed from a number one problem. Now, the problem didn't start with the... Uh, with simple working people, but rather higher learning, educated circles created this problem. Now this problem can uh, no better be stated than an insider of the biggest governmental conspiracy that has ever hit the face of the earth. It was where an innocent man paid the ultimate price without a trial. We're in John chapter 18 and look at verse 37. John 18 and verse 37. It says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Look at Pilate's reply in 38. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? You know what, Mr. Pilate? It seems like you've, you've uh, been to too many college classes. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he doesn't know truth when it's staring at him in the face. You know, what a shame. So because this upper uh, uh, escalon untouchable was educated and elevated, we find that old adage to be true. What's the adage? Education without salvation equals damnation. Education without salvation equals damnation. That's why I think, I mean, and you know, my, my kid's very young, and I think most of you have already done your kid raising, but I think it's key for Christian families to try to get their children to go to some type of Bible education or get grounded in the Bible Amen. prior to going to a secular uh, college especially a secular college. Now, um, this is the angle we come from when we're addressing the topic we're looking at today. People who have been mind manipulated have a very hard time understanding things that should be very basic. Um, so what do we do? We always do the same thing. We go to that old, dusty, 1611 King James Bible that's always a thousand years ahead of modern minds. Amen? And that's just what we do. And, and you know what? And, and our outcomes are more effective. You know, we are left with less questions than they are left with more questions, you see? So, I mean, uh, whatever you want to do with that. But today's topic, we're looking at God is balanced in, even in His love. Love today is probably the most unbalanced topic in false professing churches and even in the body of Christ. Because a lot of these uh, folks are coming to regular Bible-believing churches and they're unsaved. Now, the conversation uh, might go like this. And I'm just going to ask. Have you ever heard of the love chapter? What is it? What's the love chapter? 
to love the world and You guys are very smart. I'm glad no one answered me because what what the regular church would say is 1 Corinthians 13. And I know Ingrid and Mary Chris remember Pastor Yancey used to chase everybody around with a bat and say that is not the love chapter. That's the charity chapter. And you better get a King James Bible. Amen. Wow. You know, and uh, but but if you really did want the chapter that you could consider the love chapter mentioning it the most, it would actually be First John four, which mentions love for uh, twelve times. So that would be the real love chapter. So uh, if you have a King James Bible, the word love is not in First Corinthians thirteen even once at all. That's anyway. So, um, God's, oh wait, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into that. Okay. So what, what we're going to look at now is actually, I do want to go into that. Be patient with me though. Cause I didn't produce this all clean and nice like I wanted to. But for those of you that know where I came from, this book seems to appear every, maybe once or twice a year up here. And I got saved in Calvary Chapel. And Calvary Chapel is probably, they can lead you to salvation and then they're pretty much done with you. Yeah. They, don't have any, they don't have anything else they can really help you with. They can tell you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if, if you're lucky, they might even use a King James Bible to show you. But uh, not often anymore. But, but in this book, uh, th this, okay, a little bit of background with Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel... Uh, started in the Jesus People movement of the 60s and the 70s. And it was a largely, a, it came largely out of the rebellious, revolutionary, hippie movement. And they started catering to these guys. And uh, whatever you want to think about all that. But, and I'm not saying that Jesus didn't die for those folks. He definitely did. But it's also very key how you reach out to people. We're never supposed to come down to a level where you're getting rid of the Bible and getting rid of the hymn books. Amen. Okay, Th These people, if they want to get right with God, they need to come to God. Okay, Amen. Just like me and you had to. Amen. We didn't say, God, come down to my level. Well, He did that in the person of Jesus Christ, and He's done doing that. Amen. But uh, I wanted to just kind of expose this thing a little bit more and I, I, I know I pull this out every so often but um, because it's people like this man who's now gone on to glory I hope Chuck Smith he's already dead this guy died um, he is the he's the founder who I kind of argue Lonnie Frisbee is but whatever <laughs> but um, in this book what you find is you find on page 135, he has, he's anti-church growth programs, which you would think is very good, right? I mean, well, that's good. You know, you shouldn't use, you shouldn't use worldly uh, gimmicks. He says, several years ago, there was a book written called The Gospel Blimp, and he pretty much, he's making fun of it. He said, they even put a message, Jesus loves you on the blimp, you know, and they're flying this blimp over their church, and and he's mocking that, like that's stupid. Uh, but then, uh, he's already told you on page 125, he's, he, uh, at one point in their ministry, they bought a radio station that he says, uh, let me find it here. This radio station, but when uh, new ownership took over, they decided to go to a contemporary music format and cut the Bible teaching programs. Well, what's wrong with that, Chuck Smith? That's what your churches do. What do you mean? Well, they got the rock bands, and that's ever since the founding, by the way. Yeah. That's ever since Chuck Smith got, had his training wheels on. Mm -hmm. They've had contemporary music. And, uh, and it's just kind of funny because uh, he's telling you this story about how they decided to buy this radio station. And then they're asking God, 
do you want a radio station in Orange County that will broadcast, broadcast worship music and Bible teaching? What's worship music? Worship music is nothing but contemporary music. That's all it is. And I used to play this stuff, so I'm a little bit educated, more than I would like to be in the arena. Uh, and then, uh, it's funny because then he says to preach the whole counsel of God. Okay. Now, Randy, why are you sharing this? I thought we were talking about God's love. I'm trying to give you an example on why most Christians, most churchgoers, are utterly confused when it comes to this topic. It's because they're being led by people like this. Um, so he says, uh, um, okay, so this is the Calvary Chapel Distinctives book. So they were always very heavy on being non-denominational. But when this book came out, let me get you a date, in uh, this, I think this is the first printing in 2000. When this book came out, Calvary Chapel became a denomination of its own. Because now they have their distinctives. See, they didn't want to call it Calvary Chapel denomination because that would destroy what they've worked for for so long. But, you know, you just change the word and then it's okay, bro, you know. Um, but he says this, and this is another one of their distinctives. It's priority of the word. Okay? And he says on page 57, Now how is it possible for a person to claim to have declared the whole counsel of God? And he says, The only way a person could make the claim to his congregation would be if he taught through the whole word of God with them, from Genesis to Revelation. Once you've taken your congregation through the Bible, then you can say to them, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. All right? I want to ask you the same question. How would it be possible to proclaim the whole Word of God if you don't have the whole Word of God? You have whole chapters taken out. You have whole portions of chapters, whole verses removed. I mean, I'm sorry, sir. Even if you're going verse by verse in a New American Standard Version Bible or, or even a New King James Bible, you don't have the whole Word of God. It's a self-defeating argument. Plus, if that's not bad enough, uh, he said... so. He says, this can't be done with topical sermons. What are we doing today? We're doing a topical sermon. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so he's, he's making fun of us. A church that will do topical sermons. And I would argue we get a lot more done with topical sermons. Although, you guys notice, I try to go verse by verse, exposition, uh, ex uh, exposition verse by verse, any chance I get. So I'm not completely against that, but I want to point this out before I show you what I'm going to show you right now. Because remember, he's all about the whole counsel of God, right? That's what he said. All right, so he says, um, he, he, he drives the nail in. He says, if you're only preaching topically, you may also tend to avoid controversial or difficult topics, okay? And the people won't gain a well-balanced view of the Word of God, okay? So he's saying he's doubling down. He's doubling down on why he hates topical sermons, okay? And then he claims we don't skip anything. That's what he claims, okay? So uh, now we're going to take him at his word. We're going to go back to page 53. Ready? Ready for some fun? Yeah. Some people object because they feel that I gloss over certain passages of Scripture. Oh. And they're correct. <laughs> and then he says, But glossing over controversial issues is often deliberate because there are usually two sides. And I've found that it's important not to be divisive and not to allow people to become polarized on issues because the moment they're polarized, there's division. Uh -huh. A.K.A. he could care less about the whole counsel of God. That's what that means. And I know he's dead. He's already in heaven. But every person that's sporting this ugly falling bird is guilty. Mm -hmm. So he wants to avoid controversy. And then on page 110, he gives a whole thing about love, 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 love. And then on uh, page 
page 67, he, d he does the death blow. And he says, uh, a few years back, oh, let, me, let me find it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Uh, 67. So he pretty much goes into how this judge not thing, how it's wrong to judge. And I don't know why I didn't write that. Oh, 52. There it is. Here it is. Because remember, if you judge others, you're not being loving, right? That's what they're accusing us of. There are several scriptures that warn us against judgment. Judge not that you be not judged. We set the standard for our own judgment when we judge others. And then he pretty much shows if, if you make a judgment on other people, you're not following the Bible. Even though the Bible says, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Okay? Amen. Yes, exactly. And love. Like if you love your daughter and some fool comes, you know, home to meet mom and dad, you better judge that fool. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you love your daughter, that is. Yeah. You better you better throw down some judgment. But but then he uh this is really funny by the way. But then he shows just how non-judgmental he is. Ready to have some fun again? <laughs> okay. Um, so he says he was in a Bible college, and there was always this guy. I'm just summing this up. There was always a guy that was sitting in the front row, and right at the worst time in the sermon, he would stand up, and with his hands raised, he'd go, Hallelujah! And the whole congregation would laugh at this guy. And his point was, it would just rock the boat. And if God was doing anything in the service, the Holy Spirit in his mind just ran out. So let's see what Mr. Non-Judgmental does about this. He says, so I determined I was going to stop it. I sat in the row right behind him. And when he leaned over to go into his hallelujah bit, I grabbed his shoulders and began to pinch a nerve and held him down on his knees. Nobody else had the courage to stop him. They just let it go on and on. And it was such a distracting thing. Uh, and then, so that's story number one of how non-judgmental he is. You know, he'd be willing to attack a person inside of a church. Uh, that's pretty non-judgmental, wouldn't you agree? No? Okay, all right. Well, let's try it again. Wow. How non-judgmental he is. He says, A few years back, I was in Colorado Springs at a retreat, and there was a man down in front who was sort of a simpleton. You could just tell by looking at him. <laughs> wow. Oh! Well, that's very non-judgmental of you to say. Yeah. You hypocrite. Yeah. So, um... And this is all in the same book, by the way. I mean, the book's not even very big. It's not even 200 pages. And it's just... I'm trying not to say what I, what I really think it is, but it, it's almost kind of like reading what some bumbling drunk would just be writing, you know, at like 2 a.m. in the morning. Um but I didn't say that, but uh, I thought it, though. <laughs> but but um, he says on, on page, uh, he says on page 128 to make no compromises. That's what he says. He says, if God's in it, it's going uh, to go his way. It's going to go smoothly, and we're not going to have to make compromises. Okay? And I uh, wrote down 52 here, and 52... 52, remember, it's the judge not thing and, uh, and how he glosses over certain scriptures. So he makes compromises. Is, is what. So on page 128, he says, make no compromises. On page 53, he says, gloss over certain passages to keep the peace. Okay? And then, then on page 53, I wanted to read this one. Beware of taking the hard stand. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so exactly. Be a coward. Yeah, don't he's standing on a solid rock, is he? No, he's not he's not standing on the promises. He's standing on the premises. 
Um, so why, why I pull that out is because he goes into that whole love, 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 love thing. And then he says, don't, you know, if it comes to the Bible, just park the Bible. Grow your church big. And, uh, oh yeah, it, let me just show you one more thing about his church marketing scheme. Okay, uh, let me find it here. Take everybody out for pizza. Yeah, I could probably just find it, actually. Um, here it is. <clears throat> but Calvary Chapel has a sort of mystique about it. What, are the, what do these people believe? Press pause. That is horrible. If you have a church that other people don't know what you believe, you are not doing your job. Okay? Amen. And then he says, he says, what do these people believe? I don't know, but let's go find out. You know what that's called? It's called a marketing strategy. And, he, and he, he's going to say exactly what he means. He says, and the whole field is ours. He says, you want to fish in as big as a pond as you can. When you're marketing something, remember no compromises? When you're marketing something, you want the largest market appeal possible. So don't chop up the market and say, well, we're just going to fish in this little market here. He says, keep the market broad. Fish in the big pond. Fish where they are biting. Ooh. Wow. He sounds like real estate. <laughs> well, he tells you why. He tells you why on page four. He says, uh, and there were times when I asked God to change the calling to being a pastor, he says. I said, God, call me to be a businessman. I seem to do well and find ease in the business world. I find it easy to make money. And Lord, I can be a good Christian businessman. I guess you were. <laughs> So, uh, that is unfortunately why a lot of Christians are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Amen. Because they're glossing over all the doctrines. And uh, anyway, if, if you want to puke, buy a book. <laughs> and um, so what we're going to look at now, God is balanced in love, alright? Um, let's do this here. All right. Now, this is not what's referred to in a lot of churches as sloppy agape, uh, Santa Claus that rewards everybody for the wickedness they've, that they've done because a loving God would never send anyone to hell. Mm. No, God must send wickedness and wicked people to hell if they reject Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, uh, where did I want to go? <laughs> because if he did not do that, God would be unjust. Okay? Now, if, if uh, I forget, if, I think I was talking to Lorenzo about this. If you got a ticket, okay, a speeding ticket, and you had to go up here in court, and that judge was known for putting people with speeding tickets in jail while he let murderers go free would you want that judge no w would you call that judge a just judge no. that understands the law and justice mm -hmm. no you wouldn't so why are you expecting god to do what that unjust judge would do you see a lot of people they're like seven day adventists jehovah witnesses and whoever else doesn't believe in hell they call them no hellers, is what they call them. Uh, that's the kind of God that they want. I'm sorry, I don't want to go into that courtroom at all. He is an unjust judge. If hell doesn't exist, he's an unjust judge. Where are people like Hitler supposed to go? Hell. 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 And if he didn't go there, God is unjust. And, you know, you just blow your brains out and then you go into the dirt. That's what seven days teach. It's called uh, annihilationalism. They came from the Jehovah, or Jehovah Witnesses came out of the seven days. Got that mixed up. 
But that's what they hold, that's what they hold in common. So um, God is balanced in love. Now, if you really want to know about love, and I think everybody here is interested, probably more so women though. Women are always in, uh, interested in love, but guys, we got to know something about it, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, we're kind of uh, rough, but uh, God's love is exemplified in the cross of Calvary. If, if you want to know anything about love, look to the cross. Amen. Now, uh, come with me real quick and let's look at this. So, it was there that Jesus Christ died for the very people yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Amen. Uh, uh, it was there that we receive a perfect picture of self-sacrificing love that God offers to all mankind. Now, you think about love. Love is not necessarily the wedding night. Love, and, and this is, I'm just trying to kind of wrap this thing up quickly. Love is more holding the hand of your dying loved one as they're going into eternity. That's more love. When, when they can give you nothing and you, you love them and you're by the bed holding their hand, praying for them, crying over them, and they can't give you nothing because they're just about to die. Love would keep a person at that bedside, you see? Now, I'm not saying there can't be real love on the wedding night, but it's different. You get what I'm saying? Real love is self-sacrificing love. Sacrificing your job to be at the hospital. You know, it's not just, oh, she's pretty. You know, it, it's, you know, you had to make a sac I'm going to lose my job because I'm not willing to leave my wife in this hospital alone. And, and unfortunately, the government is, is making people leave their wives in the hospital now, which is an injustice to you. It really is. And they will give account. They will give account before a holy, righteous God for what they're doing to families. Amen. Amen. But, um, uh, so when we go to the cross, we see Jesus Christ offering kindness to his killers. Literally. They are in the midst of murdering Jesus Christ. Now, it's hard for us to think of being kind to the very person or people that were trying to kill you. Wouldn't it be kind of rough? You know, as they're starting to skin you alive and you're like, oh, I, I love you, I'll pray for you. You know, and, uh, you know, uh, but this is exactly what Jesus Christ displayed for us at the cross. Turn to Isaiah 50, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. And uh, if somebody can get that for me, Isaiah 50, verse 6. And if uh, somebody can get John 3.16 for me. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. So, in, in that verse especially, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever, whosoever believeth in Him. Amen. Even those that are smiting Him upon the cheek. You see? And plucking His beard from His face. So then, so we see that love is at the cross of Calvary, amen? And we see that uh, he showed kindness to his killers. This is real love right here. Um, next, uh, we see that it's a self-sacrifice for the selfish, And uh, if somebody could get Romans 5 8 for me. Romans 
But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. While we were what? <laughs> yet sinners. See that? That's when Jesus Christ was sent to die for you, when you still hated him. Amen? And uh, 1 John 3, 16 and 17 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. You want to know what love is? Here it is. Because he laid down his life for us. That's how we know he loves us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. It says in verse 17, But whoso hath this... Uh, uh, whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So this love is a self-sacrifice for the selfish. Jesus Christ, even when you didn't want it, he extended himself to you. Freely. Amen. Exactly. Freely. But it cost him a whole lot. Sure Amen. So, and then uh, number three, about this love, because you want to know about love, you just study the cross. That is the gold standard of love. All other love in the world is measured to that love. You see? I don't think that's a far-fetched statement. I think that's a really, I think that is an enlightening statement. You know, we measure all love by that no matter if it's husband to the wife, wife to the husband, kids to the you know, parents, parents to the kids, on and on, relationships, friends. They, they all are measured to the gold standard of Jesus Christ on that cross. Um, and then thirdly, giving when there's nothing to gain. And uh, for that, we're going to look at Hebrews 12, 2 through 3. Sorry if my writing's kind of ugly. It always is. Let's look at Hebrews. Oh, 12, 2, and 3. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is, now look at that, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So you know what? You might have it hard. You might have it hard. You might be misunderstood. You might be mistreated. Uh, you might be getting hurt by people. You never got more misunderstood, mistreated, and hurt than Jesus did. So it, the Bible is telling you to uh, consider this lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Like, how can I keep getting this injustice all the time? Why does it just never go my way? Think about Jesus, what He went through. That's going to help you get through it. I mean, you want to talk about, you want to talk about somebody that got it in the neck and didn't deserve it. See, with us, <laughs> people could ar always argue, well, you're not perfect. Right? Nobody could say that to Jesus. <laughs> I mean, they, they had to hire false witnesses against him. And everybody knew they were lying. Amen. So think about that when you're getting it in the neck. Um, next. Um, so God is balanced in love. And the love is exemplified in the cross. Um, and we talked about that right here. So next, I want to look at what this love should do for us, okay? This love should give us a love for God. And specifically... More of a love for the God of the Bible. So, 
There are things that the modern Christian thinks he must apologize for about the God of the Bible. Well, I'm sorry, guys, but hell's real. Huh? I'm sorry, guys? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sad to say, but, you know, when Joshua was coming through Canaan, he killed a lot of people. Well, I'm sorry to say, but why do you keep apologizing? It sounds to me like you're not on the same page. Amen? Amen. Now, um, God is not considering apologizing for any situation I'm about to mention. At all. Um, I'm going to mention... Uh, only effeminate, people-pleasing, popularity seekers cringe at what I'm about to mention. God drowned the whole world but eight people. And He would do it again if He didn't put His seal up in the heavens, the rainbow, which is not the LGBT symbol. It was God's covenant between man and Him that He would never drown this earth again. He keeps his word. He's going to do it with fire next. Which means he's going to do it again. Why would he apologize? He's going to do it again. It has yet to be done. It's been prophesied. Next, God ordered the destruction of men, women, and children in Canaan. And Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ who did it. That's a type of the second advent when Jesus Christ comes back and is squishing the UN until the blood goes to the horse's bridle. Why would he apologize for that? He's going to do it again. You see? What about when God rained down fire and brimstone upon people who had gender dysphoria? He wouldn't apologize for that. Now, uh, go to Psalm 711. Now, we're talking about the God of the Bible here. We're not talking about the God of any contemporary modern church, what they're sharing. We're talking about the God of the Bible. Go to Psalm 711. Now, if... Uh, all right. Give me an amen if you're there. Psalm 7. Okay. It says, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. When's the last time you heard Joel Osteen talk about that verse? Does he just gloss over that one too? Is, is he trying to fish in the big pond? Yes. I think so. See, it, it's, it's like... I'm, tr I'm trying to think what, what it would be like. Um, like, if, if I was to censor you, okay, and I was trying to tell all my friends about Virgil, okay, and I'm like, okay, you know, and, and we'll say I left out one key thing about Virgil. That he's married. And, and I said, oh yeah, Virgil's a great guy. And, and it almost comes to a point where may, maybe it's, it's almost like I'm trying to find him a date. And I mention everything but that he's married. Now that is key information about Virgil. You will never understand Virgil unless you know that number one thing, he is married. So when you're going out there marketing and fishing in the big pond with, G with Jesus Christ and you're leaving out this one key element that he is just, that hell is real, that hell is hot, that hell is eternal, you are missing a very big portion about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. It, it, could you imagine how you would feel, Virgil, if somebody did that to you? How do you think God feels when they do it with Him? When they censor Him? You're, seeing, you're start, starting to see some uproar about YouTube censoring people. You see how those people feel? 
How do you think God feels with new Bible perversions and preachers that won't preach the truth that are glossing over because they're fishing in the big pond? Hosea 14.9 says this, Who is wise, and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them? For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. See, transgressors can't handle the fact that God is just. They can't. They can't. Hell is real? Well, oh, I don't know if I can believe in a God like that. <laughs> well, yeah, the way you live, I would understand. You know, but some, somebody uh, mutilate your daughter in the backyard. Uh-huh. I bet you'd say, I know there's a hell. I know there's a hell. You see what I'm saying? You just kind of switch the tables a little bit. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you want the God of the Bible when it's convenient. And that's a big problem. Amen. You need the God of the Bible today and tomorrow and the next day. You need to know Him for who He is. Why? Because the ways of the Lord are right. That's why. And if, if you don't learn to agree with what this Bible says, you're going to have a very hard life. You're going to have a very hard life. And if we can get that God is love, because that's what the Bible says, God is love. And we know where to go measure love at is the cross of Jesus Christ. Um, you need to start to develop a love for that God. That's what you need. More than some over-the-counter pills more than some uh, positive mental outlook. M more than, I mean, I, I've seen the guys, uh, they exercise and they say, you're good, you're great, you're never going to be late. You, you, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry. You're not good and you're not great. And just the fact that you're having to say it to yourself tells me the type of person you are. You need to get right with God. <laughs> hey, Amen. Um, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Amen. So you need a love for God. Next, and if you're wanting to know how to have a love for God, get a love for God's Word. Amen? Amen. And I'll put here in parentheses his words, okay? Because I'm not talking about some floating mystic Jesus Christ in John chapter 1. God has documented words that are able to be located and duplicated and copied and handed out to be a blessing. <laughs> God breathed. Uh, write down uh, John 14, 23. And in John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Amen. You want to know how a lot of people uh, read into that? He will keep my words. He will be a good boy. That's how a lot of people read that. You know how I read that? I read it how it says, He will keep my words. I will keep his words. I will keep them with me. I will keep them in my memory. Keep them. His what? His words. His words. God holds his word in more esteem than his own name. His words. That's, that's a big deal. And if it isn't to you, it is to him. So it is a big deal. Because he's, he's the one with the final say-so, not you. Oh, well, you know, I don't really take it like that. Who cares what you think? 
Thus saith the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 That's, what I, that's why I came here today. I want to know what the Word says. Not what any man says. So you need a love for God's Word if you ever think that you're going to love God and understand that God is a balanced being. You need to start being more affiliated with a King James Bible. And until you do that, you're not going to know Him very well. Why? Because you refuse to read His love letter. How do you think He feels with that? He took the time to write you a love letter and you refused to read it. What if you wrote the love of your life a love letter and you found out they never read it? Or they just left it in the hallway on that nightstand thing, you know, and dusted it off every now and then. That's disgusting, right? Wouldn't that anger you? How do you think God feels? That's rough. So, this love for God's Word, by the way, BTW, is a love for every word and verse. Uh, write down Proverbs 30, verse 5. Proverbs 30, verse 5. And it reads like this. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. You know what? God seems to be under the impression that every word is available. You know who doesn't believe that? any contemporary Christian pastor in the Antelope Valley. They don't believe they don't believe they have God's Word. They don't believe they have God's words. They think that this is just the best we have of a messed up telephone game where it was all on man to hold it together. And if it was all on man to hold it together, I'd probably have to believe them. Except for the big glaring fact that God doesn't believe them. Let's go to Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. Randy, this is kind of a lot of Bible verses. Well, amen. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, if somebody can read that for me. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them uh, from this generation forever. So who preserves them? God. It's His job. It's His word. Not you and your higher critics, Westcott and Hort, or whoever else you think, your John MacArthur's, whoever else you think is your, your, your scholar of the day. God's ways and God's words are right and pure. And these men are just going to fall by the wayside, just, just like the last thousand that God outlived. And His word is still here, by the way. And, and what I'm saying is word, I don't mean any Bible. I mean the King James Bible. And if you don't believe that you have God's actual words, what are you doing getting a paycheck using a book you don't believe? That's kind of scary to me. <laughs> That's kind of rough. Sounds like somebody has some honesty issues. Maybe you should sit in the pew a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Amen? <laughs> now, um, God uh, to God, in His Word, it says, Every word of God is pure in Proverbs 30, verse 5. And we need to get, if we're ever going to have a love for God, we need a love for His Word. And I mean His words. Every verse. Every word. Okay? And then... Another thing about God is you need to start loving doctrine. You need to have a love for doctrine. Amen. Uh, write down 2 Timothy 3.16. 
2 Timothy 3.16, just like what Brother's quoting here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, number one, for doctrine. Amen. Number one, for doctrine. You know, I, I've sat in the car and I could name his name, but, you know, he's an old man. And anyway, it, it's, it's, it's a shameful thing that he said to me. But you know what? As we were sitting there, he goes to some big vineyard church over in Lancaster at the time. He said, Randy, you know there's no doctrine in the Bible? And I quoted that verse to him. And that guy's probably been going to church two of my lifetimes. What's he learning? Okay, well say, okay, look. Let's take all the responsibility off of his milky paid off preachers okay that that are glossing over and fishing in the big pond and let's just say if that guy just read a page of the bible every day of his life wouldn't he know that there was doctrine in the bible he's not even reading for himself Amen. that's good so you're getting trained when you're coming to a church with a bouncing ball that does not encourage you to bring your own Bible, that does not encourage you to open your Bible and check out what the guy is saying. You are being trained to just... And that's it. They just feed you... You know what that's called? That's called Roman Catholicism, Dark Ages, 1500s, Iron Maiden, Stretcher, you know, drop them on, on the pyramid thing, you know, uh, put their hands behind their back and pull them up till the shoulders let out. I mean, that's what you are being trained for. In the average American home, I, last I checked, three Bibles in the average American home. And they're not being read. That's a shame. That's scary. Why? Because people do not love God. Because they don't want the God of the Bible who is a balanced being. Who is a just God that is love and proved His love and now demands your love. Demands it. Commands it. Um... What else do we need? We need a love for God's ways. Look at Isaiah 55 verse 9. And in your other hand, get Hebrews 12. Uh, 5 through 8. And then I'll get 1 Peter. Unless you have a third hand. 1 Peter 4, 17. So Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But God, I just don't see how you could just be so mean to just make a hell. Well, don't worry about it, kid. You'll get it one day. God's ways are higher than yours. You know, it's, it's, it's like if Josiah is telling me, why can't I have ice cream right now? Don't worry about it, kid. It's bedtime. No, but tell me why. I'm not going to sit here and barter with you. You're four. It's bedtime. You don't understand. Maybe you'll understand in 10 years. <laughs> you know? I, I, it just doesn't matter. And God doesn't need to be questioned. He needs to be believed and trusted and followed and obeyed. Amen. 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 And uh, I, th I think I put it for the last song, but trust and obey. Yeah. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Not to sit there and accuse and question and point the finger at God. It's your fault I'm here. It's your fault. That's what, that's what they do. 
It's your fault this happened to me, God. I'm mad at God. Really? You're mad at God? And, and I mean, he put it documented. Yes, you should not live a sinful life that is going to uh, uh, earn a whipping. <laughs> he told you thousands of years ago. Now, uh, all right, and then Hebrews 12, 5 through 8, it says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which, which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Listen to this. Listen to this, parents. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, that's a paddle, or I guess more biblically a rod, it's the rod of reproof is what the Bible calls it, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now, another thing in this book that I didn't get to, uh, that I didn't get to uh, share with you was their distinctive of how you can walk away from salvation. Uh, that's found on page 117. And he teaches a works and faith salvation. He says, yes, of course, I believe in eternal security. As long as I abide in Christ, I'm eternally secure. That's called you're a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. And you're claiming that you're a Christian. Page 117 and 118 on this. <sighs> you know the one thing people... And this is what we were talking to Melinda about, remember. Is, you know what? She said, you know, I trusted Christ years ago. And, you know, I said, Sis, do you feel like God's chastising you? You feel like you're under the rod of reproof and correction? And she just like started crying. She's like, yes. I'm like, you know what? That's negative confirmation that you are saved. You know, because if you weren't saved, you could, you could drink, you could smoke, you could shoot, you could chew, you could do whatever you wanted to do, and you wouldn't feel bad. Amen. At all. <laughs> but it is a good sign when you feel that paddle on your rear end that you are a son. Because as the Bible stated... It said uh, right here, whereof all are partakers. Of what? The chastisement. Because if you're without chastisement and correction, you should feel very scared. You never had God correct you? You should feel very scared. You never felt the Holy Spirit convict you? You should feel very scared. Why? Because all... Children of God get the chastisement. Amen. And you're not a child of God until you've received that adoption by grace through faith alone, Chuck Smith, where you receive a gift. The Bible calls it a gift. Amen. And 1 Peter 4.17, it says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? We know what the end of them is. It's the lake of fire. So, it doesn't end there, though. Uh, the last thing we need a love for, if you're going to understand this God as a balanced being, you need a love for a few things. A love for God. A love for God's word. A love for God's ways. Amen? Amen? What about a love for God's people? Yep. Now, if we didn't say enough hard things, let's say a few more. A love for God's people 